So thank you, John, for coming, coming to Smith and for giving tonight's anti-racism lecture and for the time to give this interview. And as you know, the faculty and I were very interested in a chapter in your book, In Polite Conversations, that you had entitled Obama Makes Whites Whiter, because it's such a powerful chapter. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, you put forth um, an argument. One of the arguments is that as racial, racial diversity increases, and we see some power shifts, such as having a first black president, seeing people of color in visible positions of power. We are also experiencing a coalescence of white identified groups fighting to retain white privileges, symbolic power, if not their actual power. So I was wondering if you could talk first a little bit about what prompted you to write that chapter. Uh, that, that, I think that's a great question. I absolutely wanted to make sure the chapter and the book in general operated as a kind of provocation. So when you think about race, when you hear names like Obama, one of the things I think that happens is everyone feels like they've heard it all before, they've already thought about it, there's almost nothing new to learn just because we feel so oversaturated with discourse around it. And so I thought, what's a way to get people to think about race a little bit differently? Think about this new president, this symbolically uh, important figure a little bit differently. And for me, it meant trying to get people to recognize what was, and still is, I think, a traditional distinction made in the social sciences between marked social categories and unmarked categories. So one of the points is to say that historically, what's considered normative in the U.S. is always stuff that is not marked as racialized in some way. And so there's this overarching assumption that part of what it means to assimilate in America to be truly American is to be able to let go of all of the particular cultural, racial, ethnic stuff that makes you distinctive, that makes you look other than what we imagine to be sort of typical white American. And so what I thought was important to just begin to get people to see is that with the ascendancy of Obama, the Obama administration, the browning of the electorate, that what we're seeing in part is a whiteness now that can't always pass itself off as unmarked, as normative. Um, as universal, that it has a particular coefficient. It, it operates the way other racialized categories operate. Doesn't mean it's biologically real, right? We can right. deconstruct it. Doesn't yeah. mean there's anything about whiteness that's the same for everyone. But it means it's harder for whiteness to pass itself off as somehow other than a specific racialized subject position. Yeah. Um, and I think that difference is important because it means historically we've only imagined whiteness speaks itself as white if it's yelling and screaming and if it's you know donning a white hood and talking about white supremacy but there's something about being able to understand whiteness as part of a larger eclectic multiracial universe that says you know whiteness can be white and have a history to it a historicity a particular past and context that's no different from the past and context that makes what we imagine to be blackness black that our job is to, and I think this is what Obama does almost in spite of himself, right? He's a figure who slowly allows us to recognize that whiteness has particular interest in the context of the U.S. body politic. It has a very specific set of ideological coefficients, and that there's something about that that shouldn't just be hijacked by white supremacy. Just like understanding blackness with a history doesn't mean you have to be a black supremacist. It can mean trying to recognize that there's nothing special about whiteness that makes it invisible, and therefore everything else becomes visible as particular, and whiteness becomes general. And so Obama, I think, is this character that we need, it, I think, at this time, because it helps us to understand that there's nothing about whiteness and the way it functions that has to be categorically, structurally different from the way all the other racialized subjectivities function, even though in the past that's been the yeah. case. So you, there is a quote in your book where um, you say, I welcome a whiteness that can speak its own name without hateful yelling or the gnashing of teeth, which is what you're talking about is sort of this move to whiteness uh, as, a, as another kind of racial experience, but not necessarily where white supremacy is, is sort of the only way that it can be experienced. Is that... Uh is that where we're heading, do you think? I mean, I, I, in some ways, I think we're going in a direction where we're becoming much more self-conscious about our racial history, 
we're playing with the ways in which we talk about our past. So for instance, you have right now a play on Broadway that's so fascinating to people because it casts the founding fathers as immigrants, as very ethnic and racialized, and tells a story about the past that actually resonates for what was going on then, but also tells us something about who and what we are now. And there's going to be more and more of those opportunities for us to question our presuppositions about what Americans are, who counts as truly American, and how we expand the category. And I think this is sort of coupled with this investment we have in what I, th I think is a very valuable aspiration, right, which is this notion of colorblindness. Yeah. So we've always wanted to say, well, we don't see color. Right. And th if, this, if there's ability to not see color, we imagine that somehow that makes us better, that makes us um, able to transcend some, some of what we right. imagine to be the most dashly parts of our own racial history. Whereas I think the better model isn't race blindness. I think it's being able to see difference without imagining hard and fast and genetically predetermined hierarchy, without imagining that there's some us versus them that race then begins to buttress and bolster. And so I think it's, it's getting out of this mindset of having to pretend color away but and it's instead seeing it more effectively, more accurately, not as something that lords over us right. or predetermines our possibility, but as something that's part of the sort of larger landscape of culture that we inherit and that it's our job to reimagine and reinterpret as we see fit and hopefully in ways that are more inclusive, that allow us to recognize just how much value comes from difference. Yeah. You know, there's this tendency we have to think that the only way we can come together as a collective is if we're all the same. Yes. Whereas I think for, I think most of the ways in which we want to talk about society's flourishing, we recognize that it's only through diversity that you can actually have the tools, the, the wide panoply of tools you need to be able to survive in difficult times. So it's, I think valuing what diversity brings and not fearing difference as something that somehow makes it less possible for us to be a functioning body politic, a real collective yeah. that works together. I mean, I don't know that we've experienced difference that wasn't really powered, you know, and, and we don't have experience with difference that doesn't come with power. Um, and I guess, I don't, is that possible for us? Well, I mean, I think there are examples, maybe sometimes seemingly trivial examples all the time of um, folks who can occupy different social roles and categories and do it in a more or less um, hegemonic and exclusionary way. And that's why, but I think that's the challenge. The challenge is to say, you know, power is always circulating. We're always grabbing for it, trying to use it, deploying it in ways that are often about self-interest. But there's nothing about the idea of setting up a distinction. And I do think this is a, a powerful point that I, I, I hope that chapter tries to make as well, that we're always carving up us's and them's. Yeah. Right. So And so we figure out the us is important, we care about the us, and then once we decide this other group is them, then we can almost do whatever we want to them, right? right? Especially if they're a threat to the folks who constitute us. And so I think there's a way in which we start the hierarchy there with the people we really care about and really love yeah. and the folks who might threaten those people. And, that's, and so we don't even feel like what we're doing is about sort of trying to grab power. Or bit. So it's already infused in our assumption about what constitutes we. And so part of it, I think, is to, to think differently about how we configure those circles of us's and them's. Why do we make them so constrained and small in their circumferences? Are the ways to expand them and feel let, less threatened by difference? I think if, if the difference isn't always already considered a threat, then I think we have less of a tendency to be as hot and quick with trying to use that difference as a justification for doing some very horrible things in, you know, in the spirit of protecting our own and who we, yeah. who we really value. But I think you're right yeah. to say our, our job is to figure out how and why we use these categories to justify things that are always in some ways steeped in a certain kind of power play. And it's a power play usually that we are able to justify and sleep well at night because we say it's about defending ourselves. Yeah. Um, and often, you know, every defense is also a certain kind of offense. So trying to own both of those right. sides at the same time, I think. Well, and the book came out in 2014 ahead of, you know, this election cycle and before we knew we would have the first female presidential nominee. And do you think that the, the, the development of nominating a white woman in this role, like, do you feel like this is continuing a movement in the same direction? Is it, is it somehow a backlash? Or, I mean, what, what sense of it do you make in terms of 
looking at um, sort of what's happening around the racialization of that that's a good question so it's it's another first right I mean yeah. so um, it is amazing that we still have first um, around categories right. that are so central right how could we you almost feel like you know after Obama how could we have not been able to do this before um, as you see the nomination of Hillary Clinton you think how could this not have been possible ever before right. um, ultimately I do believe one of the things that reminds us is we can't think about any of these categories race or gender ethnicity religion sexuality in some sort of vacuum disentangled from everything else right and so how do we make sure we're keeping all of the productive tensions between and among these categories together as we try to analyze what's happening um, ultimately I think our job is going to be to figure out what we gained as a function of the last seven plus years what will be eight years of Obama what worked in terms of us trying to think critically with one another we always want to have conversations on race I think we actually did a pr very poor job over the last seven years of talking, really talking honestly about what race means. I think one of the things hopefully that we'll be able to imagine in the lead up to the um, next uh, election is to really get us to think about how to plug this discussion about race and racial difference and racism into productive and fertile dialogue with the ongoing commitments we have to gender difference. Yeah. And, and, and often we want to like think of them as blocks we move around separately. But hopefully one of the things that um, you know Clinton, who's running, all, a lot of experts argue, on the legacy and on the efforts and actions of Obama, one of the things that might allow her to do and her campaign to do is to think about the productive points of cross-fertilization between what he allowed us to say and not and yeah. think about vis-a-vis -vis race and what her candidacy might allow us to think about the relation between race and gender as these complicatedly intersecting yeah. um, categories of difference but also of community that we can use in ways that actually doesn't have to be destructive right yeah yep no not destructive very difficult mm -hmm. I mean I just think of social work education and um, all you know schools across the country trying to always continuously working on trying to create the right kind of climates yeah. and conversations in the classroom even in sort of that tall order so along that line though what 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 is our role do you think like schools of social work and social how what is our role to play in this so i mean i would probably talk about the role of social work schools and social work as a profession in three different ways um, the first, I think, is to disabuse people of often very impoverished notions of what social work actually entails. Most people have yeah. no idea of what social workers do and the various levels at which social workers operate, right, right? from the macro to the micro. Like getting actually doing uh, a job of re-educating people about what social work contributes, thinking holistically about social problems, I think that's key. I think the second thing that's, I think, really important for us as a profession that's really always at the center of important issues, often national tragedies as well, is to actually remind everyone that our job is to think about the distance between theory and practice. Right? It's social work is one of these, um, I think, incredibly powerful fields that has to understand all the most cutting edge social science, you know, evidence-based theory. But we also recognize that in the world, one of the first things that leaves you are the sort of theoretical scaffoldings when you're in the middle of something in the moment and have to make a snap decision. So I think it's getting social work students to become social workers who can work quickly in the moment, whose instincts are the right instinct, the instincts about, yeah. about inclusion, about connection, about community. Then I think the third thing that I've always found really important about um, social work and the leadership role I think it can play around a lot of these important issues is I do feel like ultimately part of what social work is very good at doing it's very good at recognizing the value of taking people seriously of listening to them mm -hmm. um, of yeah. understanding you can learn from your interlocutor no matter what right. you know status or station they are in life and so being able to take that that sensibility that ability to respect the other to, uh, to really try to understand them holistically not just as a particular client in this sort of small narrow-minded way not just as one racial category, not just as a gender, but as a full human being who, whose life you want to make better. And I think there are often so few moments when we really celebrate our capacity, our commitment to just trying to make the world a better place in a way that isn't superficial, that isn't besides the fact um, that we don't do enough 
really trying to make sure we do effectively. And so I think those for me are the things social work always does well. We can always do a better job at making it clear to people that sometimes even though you know, it can be done inconspicuously, it can be done without a lot of fanfare, right? Um, yeah. That it isn't, it's all the more important for its ability to do this work in a way that's stealth but effective. And that actually allows people to see and feel the difference that social work makes in their lives. So I think it's, it's important stuff. And I feel like our students, students you put out here, I feel like the students we're putting out at the University of Pennsylvania are really doing an incredible yeah. job. And we just want to, I think, support them so that folks recognize who they are before they get there and know the skills that they're bringing with them. Thank you so much for taking your time. This has been a wonderful opportunity to hear your thoughts. Thank you for the questions. Right. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks.